Okay. Can you close the door, please? In the back. Okay. So uh, first, like uh, administration. Um, <coughs> I always say that uh, when I don't, uh, uh, like twice, uh, twice a year. So this is, I think, the second time that I want to make it clear that the test in this course will be in the last. Uh, last class of the semester, okay? So it's not, it doesn't fall in your uh, exam period. And uh, I told you that uh, I don't want people not to come at all to the class. So I, I did a part of the, uh, a part of the grade of the course is 10%, uh, like more or less is like basic attendance, meaning that I would say like from now on, because uh, up until now, um, I said that people that had like a background in biology or more, uh, didn't have to come through the first two classes and stuff like that. Uh, but from now, I'm going to start uh, like handing out uh, attendance uh, counts or attendance uh, uh, registrations. And uh, so I expect that like at least that most of the classes uh, you will come. I'm not saying that if there's a class that you can't come or stuff like that. So it's not so, uh, yeah. So. Last time, in the previous chapters, uh, we talked about tertiary structures, which is actually the, the long-term uh, folding uh, of, a, of the protein, or long-range folding of the protein, in contrast to uh, secondary structures. Uh, I showed you different uh, ways to, uh, to show tertiary structures, or proteins in general, uh, from the most simple, simple, uh, simple way to more complex. And I thought that this is like my favorite uh, a form of showing a protein because this is, I think, actually how the protein looks like. But uh, obviously, each type of presentation has its own uh, advantages. And uh, we started talking about protein motifs, which are combinations of secondary structures. Uh, protein motifs are uh, relatively simple structures and relatively uh, small structures. We defined uh, a calcium binding motif, uh, RNA binding or DNA binding motif. We talked about, uh, and also a fibrous uh, uh, motif. We said a few words about consensus sequences. And then we went on to protein domains, <coughs> which are larger definitions or larger uh, structures in the protein, normally more than 15,000 uh, Daltons. Uh, uh, for proteins that are very large, we will normally divide them into areas or regions of the proteins, which we will call domains, because it makes it much easier for us uh, to talk about and describe that protein. So for example, uh, in the hemagglutinin protein that we see here, we will say that it has like a fibrous domain and a globular domain. And in this case, <coughs> uh, the domain describes like the anatomy or the morphology of the protein. But domains can also describe function. And for example, uh, if we know that uh, this protein, this small protein, which is called EGF, or uh, uh <coughs> I think a muronic growth factor, and uh, some proteins that are not EGF will have EGF-like domains, okay? So for example, uh, this can only also entail uh, on their function, but if you hear like some kind of like these, uh, something like domain, then you know that it, a lot of times it, it's uh, some kind of, uh, uh, like it's a domain that's very similar to like a smaller pro protein or peptide and that makes it, makes it uh, much easier to describe the different components uh, of proteins. So <coughs> I gave you the metaphor uh, of, uh, to discriminate like, what is the motif or what are domains. Uh, it's m mainly the matter of size, but also a lot of time domains are uh, used to describe a larger structural component. So for example, in this example here, if we have a fan in both an engine motif and an AC mo uh, and, uh, sorry, engine domain and an AC domain, then both of these fans have the same functions, more or less. They move air, right? Uh, but they are part of different uh, structural components of the larger protein that in this case is a car. But also these domains can be part of different proteins, like a generator or a greenhouse. Um, so they don't have to always come with one another. So this is like the, the hierarchy or the separation in which we describe uh, proteins. So, <coughs> From this moment on, we moved on to the next structure, which uh, next level, which is uh, the quaternary or fourth level when describing proteins. And 
it's important to make the distinction that from this moment on, we're talking about uh, like a subunit organization, meaning that it's not the same molecule. Okay, so up until this level, all these structures were related to the same molecule, meaning that it was covalently linked with one another. And from this level on, uh, it's, it's our organization that is, what do we say, multimeric or of different components that are not covalently linked to one another, but interact with all the other forces that we, that we learned about. So <coughs> one of the most classic examples, which is hemoglobin, uh, is what we call a heterotetramer, because it's composed of two alpha and two beta subunits, which are very similar, by the way. And um, they associate with one another through non-covalent interactions, okay? But all this is what we will say the hemoglobin protein, okay? It's not that the alpha or beta subunit are proteins by themselves, because this is like the form that we see in the body and the form that is functional, then we will say that this is the protein. Normally, the protein is the level of the function, okay? So the alpha, we will not see in uh, eukaryotes or vertebrates the, uh, like the alpha or the beta subunit separately. And uh, also this is important because uh, when we talk about genes, you also understand that because uh, they're not from the same source, not only that they're not covalently linked, they're also from different genes. Okay, so they can be transcribed from different parts of the genome. And if it doesn't, uh, but don't worry if uh, it doesn't make sense what I'm saying because we're gonna talk about it in length in the following classes. So, yeah. The third level, there, there are proteins that stop at the third level, okay? okay? That their function, like uh, we saw, like uh, EGF is a protein that will stop and it's, it doesn't have, it's not a multimeric protein. So you can have single unit proteins that they are just, that the definition of, the, of them as a protein will stop in the third level, but not below that. You don't have proteins that are only secondary because there's no such thing because the actual, the actual folding in 3D is what we call the third structure. So you have proteins that are just composed of one unit, and then, and then the third structure will be the last, and, and you have proteins that are constructed from the fourth level of organization, and then there will be um, multimeric proteins, okay? So, but you need to understand, again, that it doesn't change the fact that there is a difference between what we define as uh, people that are observing the biology and what hap actually happens in biology. So separate like between the two, like this is, now we're really talking about definitions of things, okay? So, <coughs> so uh, but this will be the last, in, in staying in the terms of definitions, the fourth level will be the last level of what we define a protein, okay? Above this level, we'll talk about multimeric organization. I give you another example of the GABA receptor um, it, this is actually a very, very typical uh, type of structure. Almost all the receptors and all the channels that uh, we're going to learn about more or less have the same structure, okay, of this, like, uh, it can either be like four or five or six or seven uh, units, but, <coughs> um, but in general, they will, always, they, they will always be composed of these almost always. I'm not going to say always because biology is never always but it will be very common to see this type of multimeric organization that forms a channel, okay? So in this case, we have a heteropentamer because it's composed of different subunits. So you have two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and one gamma subunit. And uh, this receptor for GABA, for example, when, when GABA, which is an inhibitor, a neurotransmitter, binds to it, it opens the channel and uh, chloride ions can penetrate uh, the cell. <coughs> Questions about that? So, for example, if this was like uh, everything was uh, was alpha males, so uh, like all the all the subunits were alpha, we will say that it's a, this is a homo pentamer, not a hetero pentamer. <coughs> so here I we talked a little bit about protein evolution, and again returning to the example of the hemoglobin. So. Um, only recently, as you say, like, just in vertebrate evolution, the hemoglobin or the beta hemoglobin, which is uh, the, probably the, the, uh, 
previous form of this oxygen binding species uh, or, or oxygen binding protein uh, during the course of evolution only recently in the vertebrate uh, um, uh, like kingdom split to alpha and beta subunit and these alpha and beta subunits later duplicated and formed this what we see as this hemoglobin <coughs> and certain like for example in uh, in algae and in the certain types of mushrooms and stuff like that, you will, you will find oxygen binding molecules that look more like the beta subunit by itself. So related to what you, the questions that you asked, <coughs> up until this stage, uh, this oxygen binding protein was uh, mono, like it only had one subunit. It was like this was the last level of the protein. Like uh, lehemoglobin, uh, like, uh <coughs> like here, is this, this is the last level of function. And in vertebrates, this is the last level of function, okay? So, and proteins that have common ancestors are referred to as homologs. And then when I read the, the questions that I gave you, I, I, I noticed that I might have went through it too fast. It's not like that, that also that the, uh, it might, might have been entailed from, my, from what I uh, explained is that, the, that this is the only, like, that when you say that it's homolog, it just means that they have a common ancestor, but also, a lot of the times, they will be very similar in their sequence of amino acid and their 3D shape, okay? So it's not like they diverge and they're completely different from one another and we say that they have a common ancestor and then we'll say that they're homologs. Actually, it's common to, like in the field of protein evolution, more or less like 80% homology or 80% identity between the sequence of the amino acid and the 3D shape it's considered to be like still uh, homologous. But just, and then I, I talked about like homology versus analogy, and to say that sometimes we can see proteins or a lot of like, uh, this is like th in terms of evolution, we can see proteins or other structures in nature that look very similar to one another, but have no common ancestry, okay? So this is like this example, when they, both of them look like Elvis, but they have no common ancestry, like they do have, but, it's very early, and uh, and these two, which look pretty similar to one another, but this is due to inheritance. So they're they're like sisters or something like that. So in this case, we will say that they're homologs. In this case, we say that they're analogs. But in both cases, there has to be a degree of similarity. Okay, not identity, but similarity. Yeah. Uh, it's, the same structure. it's not exactly the same structure. I'm not getting into the differences between them, but there's a few, like, there's a deviation in the number of amino acids. I don't know exactly how much, but they're, they're distinct, and also they're from different genes. Like, uh, some, some, somewhere along the course of evolution, this gene has probably, like, duplicated itself in the genome, and then one, one of them, actually both of them underwent modifications. Like, even the beta hemoglobin is not, is not the same as the leomoglobin. So you see that also more in the, in, in the morphology it looks different. But the, so evolution is something like that continues all the time. Uh, but these are, we will say that alpha and beta are probably also homologs uh, because they're pretty similar to one another, but again, there are differences between them. Just because in our genome we find both of these genes are pretty similar to one another, but there are differences in the amino acids. So one of them is alpha and one of them is beta and also they associate with one another, okay? So <coughs> then we went on to the last level of uh, what we find of, uh, uh, of protein structure, which is macromolecular uh, assemblies. And in macromolecular assemblies, we start talking about cooperation. So this is, again, the definition is due, due to function, okay? Why do we make this distinction to macromolecular assemblies? Because they, it's proteins and other, tra other factors that it can be also RNA molecules, a small peptide, and uh, sugars, and a lot of things that can uh, cooperate with one another in order for a specific function. So one of the examples for, in this case, if you have um, a lot of different types of proteins can work together and form, in this case, the, uh, what we call the mRNA transcription initiation machinery, which is in charge of uh, transcribing genes or to translate not translate, but transcribe genes from our DNA uh, <coughs> to the level of the, of the RNA. But again, we're going to talk about that. 
uh, more thoroughly in the next classes. So, uh, one of the most famous examples of macromolecular assembly is although a lot of people think that this is a protein, it's not a protein, this is, a, uh, this is the ribosome. The ribosome is in charge of, you can say, like the next step. So, it's in charge of translating RNA molecules into, into proteins. So, this is like the power plant uh, of proteins. Uh, we know a lot of bioelectric structures do uh, about the structure of the ribosome due to ADN or not, and the ways that she uh, <coughs> uh, managed to decipher the structure of this uh, protein or at least part of it, not this protein. It's a macromolecular assembly. It's actually composed out of about 80 different types of proteins and five different types of RNA molecules in eukaryotes, like in our bodies. Uh, this ribosome is like this huge complex that is composed of 80 different uh, proteins. So it's, it's so large that actually we can start, like up until this level, uh, the proteins were too small in order for us to see them like in, um, in, uh, in microscopy. And this is the first level, like this, or, this organization is where uh, the size of it is actually large enough for us to start seeing it in an electron microscope. So this is like, uh, this is the organ of the cell which is called the Rafi R. And this is like a section uh, in a cell, and you have those ribosomes that are sitting on top of the membrane uh, of this organelle. So, I finished by, give, by giving you, I think, the best metaphor possible, which is the Power Rangers metaphor, because we can all agree that, and again, this is like a definition, but we can all agree that all of the Power Rangers have their own entity and their own function by themselves, but if uh, times get hard, then they have to form a megazord in order to deal with, uh, with the trouble uh, that occurred. So this is like the macromolecular assembly of the individual proteins that can also have distinct function by their own. Okay, so <coughs> this is where we finished. No, we didn't finish. Actually, we finished much, much later. Okay, so I need to go over it much faster. We talked uh, a little bit about protein folding. We said that the, theoretically there are, there's a lot of different types of conformations that a protein can fold, but in essence and reality what happens is that we see the proteins in nature only in their native state, okay? Like, and apart from proteins that misfold. And we said that it, this has a lot, of, a lot to do with the entropy or increase in entropy in the water and decrease of entropy in the protein, and uh, that the interaction with the water and the hydrophobic effect has a lot to do uh, with the proper folding of a protein to the native state. And we said that there's a lot of paths along the way that a protein can take, but in the end, and this is like in vitro, in a vial, a protein can take a lot of different conformation, but in the end it will also al only end up in the native state. In vivo, or in the cell, the proteins are not allowed to like fold freely by their own. They have chaperones, which is a very good name, and we talked about two types of chaperones, molecular chaperones and chaperonings. The molecular chaperones are small molecules that are no normally named as heat shock proteins. And they also gave you the intuition of why. And these uh, heat shock proteins or uh, molecular chaperones guide the protein through uh, harnessing the energy of ATP, again, like we saw a lot of times, and uh, making sure that the protein will not only uh, fold properly, but also very fast like much faster than if you would put the protein in a vial and you will let it spontaneously fall to its native state. Another type of uh, chaperone is the chaperonins, or the chaperonins, which are like lar large barrel structures uh, that, that create like an environment that is favorable for the properly folded, for the, for the proper folding of the protein. So we said, a few words about what happens when proteins misfold and all these diseases. Uh, this, in short, all these diseases happen when, uh, when proteins misfold. And we said that, <coughs> and then we said that after the protein is folded, uh, uh, is folded and produced, it also undergoes modification. So the most common modification uh, that occurs is the acetylation, which normally happens in the end terminal of the protein. Like almost all the proteins are acetylated in the end terminal. Proteins that we see that are not uh, acetylated are a lot of times degraded by, uh, uh, by proteases in the cell. And then we talked about the different modifications that the side groups can have, like not only the, the edges of the protein, also the side groups or the amino acids themselves can have 
uh, different modifications, and we gave this all these different examples. Specifically, I want you to focus on phosphorylation because we're going to talk about it a lot in this course. And I told you that phosphorylation is, is the kind of modification that activates the protein. Okay, so you can think about it as like an energy transfer um, uh, reaction. Not only, not always. Sometimes it's uh, also a structural thing, but a lot of the times phosphorylation uh, will like charge the protein uh, with energy. Uh, to to do its own like its function. So we said that because of all these different modifications, actually the the the, the diversity in the molecular structure of different amino acids that we see uh, in the end in functional proteins is much more than the 20 amino acids that we started from. Because these 20 amino acids can be modified chemically. Okay, so there's a lot more complexity than these 20 amino acids. Um, a little bit about processing like the type of modification can be also cleaving of this, uh, of like a large protein can be cleaved into separate parts. Uh, this, this process are important, for example, in uh, digestion and in block regulation and etc. Then we mentioned the uh, degradation process, specifically with ubiquitin. Um, I'm not going to describe this process, but it's like a sequential process that in the end the protein is shipped to what uh, to the structure which is called the proteasome, which recycles the protein. And this is really where we finished, where we start talking about enzymes. And I th and I said that enzymes are like the the chemists of the cell, or they are like the the, the catalyzers of the cell. And uh, and again, it's very important to me for me to for you to understand is that um, when we talked about in previous classes about K equilibrium. And that the fact that we, if we put uh, in a specific chemical reaction, if we put uh, like an X concentration of reactants, due to the K equilibrium, we know how many products we'll get if we give it an infinite amount of time. Okay? So the enzymes don't change the K equilibrium of, uh, of a chemical reaction. So they will not affect the amount of end products that we're going to get uh, from this chemical reaction. But what they will do is that they will lower the activation energy or the energy that is needed in order for the reactant uh, to, be, um, to be converted to the product. And by, by this catalysis, because we're talking about cellular structures and in cellular structures or in cells, I don't know if you remember, but I told you that uh, you never get to a state of chemical equilibrium almost because you always have like uh, like the, the products are actually reactants of the following steps, so uh, almost all the reactions are uh, ongoing all the time, so you almost never get to a state of chemical equilibrium. And because of that, the enzymes are actually uh, <coughs> are very important to, in the rate of, a, of a transition from the reactants to products, and they make sure that, uh, that the reaction can progress much, much faster than what, what it would progress without a catalytic agent. Okay, so like a nice metaphor is like thinking, it's not completely accurate, but still uh, you can think about like gasoline, if you want to ignite a fire, then you need, <coughs> you need a much smaller fire, much smaller uh, flame in order to ignite a fire if you have gasoline uh, in the presence, when you want to uh, like ignite, your, ignite your bonfire uh, relative, to, uh, relative to what you would have to invest if you didn't have uh, gasoline is like the, the catalyzer uh, of that reaction. So, not only that they have uh, immense catalytic power, they're, they're also very, very specific. Like some enzymes are more specific than others, but they're very particular to the to the types of proteins or the types of uh, substrates uh, or the type of like molecular entities that they act upon. Okay. So, and the the, re the way that they do it, uh, that they do it. It's actually similar to everything that we've seen up until now. So the, the same way that the alpha and beta subunits of, hemoglo of hemoglobin know how to interact specifically with one another and not with another protein, so because they have like these complementary interactions due to the amino acids uh, that they have in the binding sites, so <coughs> also amino also enzymes are like uh, a perfect match for their substrate. Okay, you can think it's not completely perfect, but uh, if it was completely perfect, then the substrate will never detach. But uh, um, but 
they fit to their specific substrate in terms of the identity of the amino, amino acids in the site groups that they have in what we call the enzyme active site. So uh, normally the active sites con constitute of two functionally important regions, uh, one that binds the substrate and another one that catalyzes the reaction. So I gave you the example of uh, PKA or protein kinase A and I told you that kinase is a protein that phosphorylates. Again, we return to the phosphorylation. And by now, you're supposed to know that the main source of phosphate or energy in the cell is the form of ATP. So adenosine three phosphate. And this enzyme, once it binds to its target peptide and to the ATP, it undergoes a conformational change from an open form to a closed form. And I showed you also specifically if we zoom in uh, to the action of the protein, I hope it, you can intuitively uh, understand why the protein uh, catalyzes its reaction, it, and, and this is why also all the proteins normally, uh, all, the, all the enzymes uh, act as catalysts, is that they stabilize the intermediate state of the reaction, or in terms lower the amount of energy that you need. It's like, you can think about it like a hill. You remember the energy function that I showed you before. So if you lower the intermediate state, or in terms like lower the hill, then it's much easier to cross from one side to the other side. So this is actually what they do. So in this case, uh, the side groups, or the cofactors in, in this case, also side groups and cofactors that the enzyme has, so again, this is the ATP molecule, and this is the target peptide. So what the, the reaction that we want to occur here is that this oxygen will bind to this phosphate group phosphate with the oxygen. So in order to do that, the oxygen, because it's so, uh, it has a partial negative charge and also it's electron cloud, it's very hard to, for it to reach, uh, and again, I'm, I'm saying it, I'm sorry for the people that uh, know chemistry, <laughs> because I'm abusing uh, uh, a lot of the things here to give you intuition, but uh, it's hard for this, uh, for this oxygen uh, atom to reach this phosphate here because it's clouded uh, by the other oxygens around it, and also electron clouds. So what actually the enzyme does is that it, it diverts or like pulls away a lot of the electron uh, clouds of the oxygen and the, and the negative charges of the oxygens, thus like opening the way for the attack, for the chemical attack of this oxygen on this phosphate. And then this oxygen um, uh, uh, like connects to the phosphate and this oxygen detaches from the phosphate and what you get uh, in the end, is a phosphorylated peptide. Okay, so we can see that in, if the if the enzyme was not there, it would be very very hard for the reaction to occur. So this actually stabilizes the intermediate state and thus catalyzes uh, this reaction. So <coughs> the last thing I showed you is that I showed you that uh, a lot of times, like I told you in the cell. Uh, it's not that you have like an enzyme that is isolated somewhere. Almost everything is like a process of a lot of different, you can think about it like a factory that needs to produce some kind of uh, product in the end. So there's not like one machine. There's like, like a conveyor belt that uh, one machine does this and then it delivers it to the next machine in line. So it's exactly like that in the cell. And a lot of time we see proteins or enzymes that work one after the other in close proximity physically in the cell. Sometimes they also associate it to, to, to one another to form like this uh, uh, protein complexes. Sometimes they, they sit on this scaffold protein or this like structure that stabilizes all different proteins. And also during the course of evolution or, and uh, <coughs> we see that proteins sometimes uh, um, it, that we see in like in one organism that are protein complexes actually fuse uh, to one another and form like a, a large a large protein that has different subunits, okay? Like a, or even or even covalently link with one another, okay? So and then it's not subunits, it's just a third structure. Questions? Okay. So this is where we finished, and I gave you questions to uh, to answer. So we we'll go over them together uh, uh, according to this uh, like the chapter, and and next time. You're also going to have questions. So next, uh, next class, you're also going to have questions. There will be protein structure and function part two. 
and we will also have to read an article. This is the first article that we're going to read about the structure uh, of the NMDA receptor, which is very interesting. So <coughs> the interaction that stabilizes, stabilize? It's wrong, right? Ah, the interaction that stabilizes. The alpha helix R. So I will ask you, and you will say if it's uh, correct or not. Hydrogen bonds between several parallel alpha helixes. Yes or no? What do you say? No or yes? No. no. Hydrogen bonds between chemical groups in the protein backbone. Hydrogen bonds between protein residual groups. No. no. Hydrogen bonds between several perpendicular alpha helices? Yes? yes? No. no. So the right, the right answer is B, in this nice green color. And uh, this, again, it relates to what we talked about, the secondary structure, that almost like the secondary structures are, are almost exclusively like defined by the backbone. We didn't talk in the level of the secondary structure, we didn't talk uh, almost at all about the identity of the amino acids, okay? So, and the alpha helix is special in terms that all the hydrogen bonds are actually uh, occupied in the structure. And this is, uh, like I said like two times uh, before, makes, it, um, makes the identity of the amino acid important to define if this structure will be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. If the amino acids are hydrophilic, it will be hydrophilic alpha helix. And if the uh, amino acids will be hydrophobic, then it will be a hydrophobic uh, alpha helix. Okay, every dihedral phi and psi angle in a polypeptide backbone has a certain range of possible values. So <coughs> there is a relatively large range for large residues amino acid. There is a relatively large range for small residue amino acid. The range is unaffected by the nature of the amino acid. The range is small for short peptides. The range is large for long peptides. No. Right. So there is a relatively large range for a small residue uh, amino acid. I actually don't like this question very much, but uh, that's why it's not in the test and it's here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what we said uh, again is that uh, small amino acids that don't have a lot of steric interference. Again, when I say steric interference, I mean that the, uh, again, you need to think about a molecule like something that's occupying space because of all these electron clouds that are surrounding uh, the molecule, like there are a lot of bulbs of electron clouds that are surrounding the molecule itself. So because of this, because a large uh, residue amino acid has a lot of steric interference, then it restricts the, the possible angles of phi and psi around the alpha carbon or the central carbon. In protein, structural motif exist. Mark the incorrect sentence. Motifs are different combinations of secondary structures. No, but you need to say, is it true? Yes. A motif implies the protein function. Yes. A motif will include the exact same sequence in different protein. No, okay? We said there is a consensual sequence. Uh, that it doesn't mean that it has to be uh, the exact same amino acid. It depends on the consensual sequence. A protein can have more than one motif. Okay, so I answered it by myself. A motif will include the exact same sequence in different proteins, it's not correct. So between homologous proteins, there is an identical sequence of amino acids? No, okay? If it's identical, then it's the same, the, it's the same protein, okay? The sequence of amino acids is what defines uh, the protein. So if it's the same amino acid, it's the same protein. Actually, sometimes we see it in the genome that there are different genes that are duplications of the same protein, but they're exactly, if they're exactly the same, then it's the same protein. So uh, a similar sequence of amino acids compared to unhomologous protein, an identity in the secondary and tertiary level. Yeah. yeah. Identity means it's exactly the same. Okay, so again, it returns to uh, the fact that this is again what we see in nature is that if for a certain uh, sequence of amino acid you have a certain structure, okay? It's not like that for a different sequence of amino acid you will get the same structure. There will always be deviations in the structure uh, because of the identity of the different, uh, different amino acids. 
Sorry. So, a similarity in the secondary and tertiary level? Yes. Okay, so it's B and D. And good. So, now that we went over a very long uh, overview of what we uh, did in previous chapters, we move on uh, to describing water molecular motors. So, I told you, ignore these images for a, for a second, I told you that cells, one of the functions that, that defines like what is a cell or what, what happens in biology is that uh, cells know how to convert one type of energy to the other. Okay, so I gave you the example that uh, in photosynthesis, uh, plant cells convert the, the energy of the sun to chemical energy. We then consume this chemical energy and our bodies, for example, when I'm doing this, my body is converting the chemical energy into movement. So specifically, if we zoom into what exactly causes this movement, these are molecular motors. So molecular motors convert, um, couple or convert ATP hydrolysis most of the time, because this is like the form of energy that is available, uh, into movement. And <coughs> uh, we will describe like two types uh, of molecular motors. If you want, you can also look at this movie that uh, regards the flagellum, which is a very, very interesting a molecular motor that has a actually it actually functions like a motor it actually spins so it's common in bacteria it's very interesting but I don't have time to talk about it and it's less important actually but it's still interesting so you can see this movie uh, about that but uh, the two types of molecular motors that we're going to talk about are one uh, one type is what we have in our muscles which is uh, <coughs> which are molecular motors that have this uh, uh, that in our muscle fibers they cause they cause contraction. So if uh, two muscle fibers are like in parallel to one another, and uh, in inside our muscle fibers we have fibers of what we call actin, and fibers um, of uh, of uh, uh, myosin. So these two uh, these two structures, because of the molecular motors that are between them, they can do this movement. Okay, and this movement is actually what happens when I contract uh, uh, my muscle. And again, this contraction is, uh, uh, is mediated or uh, the power for this contraction comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. So, <coughs> specifically, uh, what happens in, uh, uh, it's a cycle uh, of the, this contraction is something that it happens continuously but on the level of the of the single motor protein, so uh, the single motor protein, uh, it's it's kind of a cycle that we can divide into four steps. So first, the uh, what do we say the myosin head of the molecular uh, of the molecular motor uh, that has also ATP binding site is bound to uh, the actin filament. So we have the thick filament, which is the myosin filament, and you have the actin filament, and <coughs> when ATP binds to this head, it undergoes a conformational change, uh, which causes it to detach from the actin filament. Then the hydrolysis of ATP is actually what causes this, you can, it's like a charging. Again, we said that the hydrolysis of ATP releases energy, and in this case it's also true. So the, the breaking down of uh, ADP, uh, of ATP to ADP and P and, and the phosphate and the free phosphate group causes like this, the, this movement of, of the head to uh, this location, to a location that is like one step back from where it was before. So we, you can think about it like a row, like someone who is rowing uh, like a, a, a canoe or some uh, <coughs> rowing its boat. So it's like the, the paddle that is moving forward. And this is actually what gives the, this is like uh, the charge uh, or like a spring uh, that uh, that gives the the energy for for the uh, for the contraction that will happen when the phosphate uh, will be finally released, then the, there will be this power stroke that will move the filaments uh, in in this contraction movement one against the other. So, and after this movement is complete, then the ADP is released and uh, the uh, molecular motor, or in this case, the myosin head of the molecular motor, will stay bound to the, 
to the second uh, binding site on the actin filament. Okay. What yeah. Difference from the third, third and fourth step? What? What difference from the third and fourth step? So in the, se the the steps are actually so the third step is when the phosphate is actually uh, when the phosphate is actually like released. So this is like the difference. And in the first step, the ATP is released. So each time it's it's a different part of the molecule. The first step is binding of ATP. Second one is the hydrolysis of ATP. So it's like the hydrolysis moves it moves it from here to here. Then there's the release of the phosphate. This is the th third step. And uh, after the release of the phosphate, there is the there is the movement. And after the movement, there is the release of the ATP. Yeah, it stays in the same place, but uh, it's like a, you know what? Actually, instead of me showing you it, there's a movie. <laughs> Especially for these things. With calcium elevated around the mark. Okay, so this movie is a little bit, here I showed you a very simplistic picture, okay? Um, the actual thing that happens is a little bit more complex. But the, the principle elevated around the myofibrils, my with calcium elevated around the myofibrils, myosin binding sites on actin are exposed, allowing interaction of the myosin cross bridges with actin. Release of the myosin cross bridge from actin requires binding of ATP. After ATP binds, it is split to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy derived from this reaction is utilized to cock the cross bridge in preparation for the power stroke. So you see, this is actually the energy, this cocking, like the hydrolysis, but later the, the phosphate is still bound in this case, but it's bound to the myosin head. Then the phosphate will be released, and this will cause the binding to the actin. The power stroke is initiated when the myosin cross bridge binds to actin. The cycle begins anew when another ATP binds to myosin. At rest, most cross bridges are in the cocked configuration, prepared to interact with actin when the tropomyosin-troponin complex is moved away from myosin binding sites on actin by calcium ions. So, so you see here they, they, they put together the third and the fourth <coughs> uh, step, but actually it happens, it kind of happens separately, but it's easier to to imagine it if it's like three steps and not four. So what they, uh, the thing that I missed out that I didn't tell you about, which they show in this, uh, this video, is that most of the myosin heads are always in the cocked conformation. They have energy because the muscles, they're like in ready position. Like they have the energy already to do the movement. And what they need now is, is some, something that will trigger the movement. And this triggering is through calcium. So when the cell is actually activated by a motor neuron, like a motor neuron is activating the muscle cell, the muscle cell uh, like uh, releases actually calcium ions that are in, inside internal stores inside the cell in response to this activation of the, of the nerve cell. And what happens is that these filaments, like the, the filaments or the, uh, the filaments that uh, before was blocking the binding sites of the myosin on the actin filament, now move aside. And I think they show it here. Yeah, so you see the myosin, like the, the binding sites for the myosin heads are actually blocked. And when calcium ions bind, they cause a shift in the actin filament, which exposes the myosin binding site. Like this. And this, is, and this happens really fast, okay? With calcium. So, and it continues on and on as long as there's calcium present. Whenever there is, uh, the calcium stopped like a, uh, the, the, like the activation from the nerve fiber uh, stops, then the calcium is very quickly pumped back to internal storage in the cell, and the, the binding sites are blocked uh, once more, and the contraction stops. Okay, so we'll take a break, and we'll return afterwards.
Wait, wait, wait for it, wait. There's also glove, glove flipping technique. So. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so see, I always say that scientists they have to wear uh, goggles and and hold Erlen Myers <coughs> because this is uh, real science and pouring solutions from one from one Erlen Myers to another is also real science. Okay, so okay, so in order to demonstrate what an enzyme or what a catalyst is. I'm going to show you in a more colorful example. And, sorry, sorry. Okay. I'm going to show you a more colorful example of exactly, because I feel that, again, in this course, you need to imagine a lot of things. So I'm trying to use a, a lot of video aids and also, ex and also experiments to show to, to, so you won't have to imagine so much. But time courses are something that is very hard to imagine. So, for example, I tell you that and then catalyze chemical reactions. So you say, okay, so the chemical reaction will occur anyway, just that the enzyme is there, it happens faster. So uh, I, in order to demonstrate what exactly like is catalytic power, what, what we're going to do is show the catalytic power of iodine, or the iodine ion, in the catalysis of this chemical reaction. So in this chemical reaction, we, we're going to use oxygen water, or what you use to uh, bleach your hair, or mechamtsan in, uh, in Hebrew, and uh, mechamtsan is something not very, is not a very stable molecule. Okay, it breaks down spontaneously to oxygen and to water, and this is why a lot of time you have to keep it in the fridge and stuff like that. And after a few years that you're holding it in your fridge, it uh, it's not efficient anymore because all the oxygen water has broken down to uh, water and oxygen. Okay, but this reaction is very, very, very slow. For example, like I've had this oxygen water uh, in our lab for like two or three years, and it's still very functional because we have very good oxygen water, much, much better than what you have at home, and uh, <coughs> also higher concentration, but it almost doesn't break down at all, okay? So the iodine ion, which is what I have here, together with soap, because soap will help me demonstrate 
and what exactly happens here. So when I add iodine to this reaction, what it does is that it stabilizes the intermediate phase of the, of the transition of the free oxygen that has to be released and bind to the, didn't I? Actually, I'm, I'm going to write it down. So, so this reaction, we said 2H2O, 2H2O2 converts to 2H2O plus two, no, one oxygen, and this is the form that oxygen is in the gas form, okay? So the oxygen that we read in the air is O2. It's actually two oxygen atoms that are linked to one another. So what happens in this process, if we break down this reaction, is that we have, we need to have the H2O uh, plus <coughs> the oxygen uh, in its free form, and then, from this, an oxygen, like two of these species have to meet one another, like the two oxygen have to meet with one another in order to form the O2. But this is a very low probability that this will happen. And because, because there's a low probability that this will happen, and I told you that chemical reactions happen in both directions, then the state where the oxygen is being released, it's uh, very likely that this oxygen will reattach to the H2O and form oxygen water again, and not complete the reaction and find its partner oxygen in order to uh, convert to oxygen gas. So the iodine ion, what it does is that it stabilizes this structure, okay? So the iodine stabilizes the structure of the lone oxygen, hence increasing the stability of the oxygen by itself, and allowing it time, or allowing it the possibility to meet another oxygen and form the oxygen gas, okay? So, and how fast will this occur, do you think? So the reason that I have soap here is because I want to trap the oxygen being released. Otherwise, you won't see it because oxygen doesn't have any color. I'm also going to add bromophenol blue, which is a nice uh, coloring. I hope it won't trigger the reaction. Now, the problem is that it's cold, but I think that I just ruined it because it's cold. <laughs> it's actually, I, I kept it in the fridge. So normally, this is a very aggressive reaction. It's very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite. So it's actually, exo it's actually an exothermic reaction, and uh, now you see the rate is increasing because it heats up a little bit. The problem is that I put the things in the fridge before. So I was trying to heat it, and I was hoping because it's an exothermic, exothermic reaction. <laughs> so just think about that all of this should have been, yeah. Yeah, now it's, now it's catching. Okay. So just imagine that all of this should have gone out of the bottle in one time, and it would fly and then land. Okay. If you want to see it done properly, look up elephant toothpaste uh, in YouTube and you'll see much more aggressive. Uh, but maybe it's good because it would create a much larger mess. What but then it it's nothing. It's water and oxygen. So you can just ah, now, now it's gone. Now all the, actually all the oxygen and water here has already broken down to, uh, to oxygen and uh, water. Yeah. Why? Because the environment is, uh, has such a low concentration like of the water and oxygen that the chemical reaction is just going all the way. Okay? Okay? So this is catalysis. I'm a little bit disappointed, but... Uh, okay. After you see an elephant toothpaste on YouTube, you'll be disappointed. Because it, it, it should have been much more impressive. But never mind. That's what it is. Okay, also you saw fumes coming out of it because this is an exothermic reaction um, because the bond uh, between the oxygen and the water is a high energy, so it releases energy to the environment. Okay, so 
Continuing to talk about molecular motors, we describe the molecular motors in the function of our muscles. And the second type of the molecular motors that we're going to talk about is molecular motors that are uh, cargo proteins, okay, or that ship cargo along the cell. So when you think about a cell, I know that uh, the typical cell is like this round thing that has like, uh, I don't know if you know the structure of cells, but you imagine most of them to be like this round spherical thing. So although it, most cells really look like that, they actually have different compartments in the cell that specify in different functions, okay? So, and uh, you can see that the highways of the cells So the highways of the cells are molecular structures or macromolecular structures that are called microtubules. They're actually really interesting because they spontaneously uh, form and deform with one another. They're composed I'm sorry, I can't do I would say that I can't do one thing simultaneously is true. Okay. Where's my presenter? Here. So these microtubules, or uh, like large tubular structures, are actually composed of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of tubulin uh, proteins. And tubulin proteins have uh, their dimer proteins. They have the alpha unit and the beta unit, or the alpha subunit and beta subunit of tubulin. And each one of these alpha, the alpha subunit is normally, is generally negatively charged, and the beta subunit is negatively, is uh, positively charged. So you can imagine these, have you ever played with these uh, like small round magnets? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like they form with one another? So this is exactly what happens with tubulin. So tubulin spontaneously interacts with one another, like these small magnets, also magnets are polar, so they interact with one another, and they spontaneously assemble to this circular structure. Actually, this is something that is very dynamic in the cell. Like in cells that are, uh, that are dividing, for example, the, the whole microtubules like go extreme conformational change and very fast. But <clears throat> we can imagine these, uh, these tubes as being like the highways of the cells. And uh, these highways are, uh, are walked on by special types of uh, motor proteins. Uh, we, we divide them into two names. We, one of them is it's called dynein, and the other one is called kinesin. Kinesin is a walking, uh, is a cargo protein that walks along this direction, like the, towards the positive pole, and <coughs> uh, dynein walks in the uh, opposite direction. Um, so this is like the, uh, an illustration of the of how kinesin walks. So we can think about it. When I see this, uh, like this graph, is actually it reminds me of someone like a person that has OCD. Okay, that is walking in the street. Have you, if you ever saw the movie uh, As Good As It Gets? So he like doesn't walk in specific areas of the sidewalk, doesn't walk in the lines. So the kinesin only walks in the beta subunits because they're positively charged. So he only walks in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the positive direction. And the other protein, which I'm not showing you here, which is dynein, will walk only in the alpha subunits along the, uh, the other way around. And this movement is coupled uh, by ATP, okay, by the, uh, by the hydrolysis of ATP, which we're not going to get specifically into the, into, the, into the molecular function of how it exactly this happens, but this movement is, again, like we saw before, it harnesses the energy or converts the energy from hydrolysis of ATP to the movement itself. And this cargo protein carries, like, large vesicles. They're actually underrepresented here. They're normally much larger than the protein itself. Uh, and th th in, in these vesicles or these cargos can be anything. They can be proteins, they can be RNA, they can be uh, materials that, uh, that the cell needs that is shipped along this uh, microtubule highway. And <coughs> just a minute. Why is it showing it here? So this is a nice, a nice animation that's showing one of these the movement of one of these kinesines, and this is a more a real representation of the vesicles that it's carrying. So you see, and I like these animations, but because it demonstrates what, like, it helps us imagine what actually happens inside the cell. So we, this is inside the cell. This is like the, especially like, 
and especially like this view, not this top, top. Okay, that this is like showing the center. Like there's a, there's a areas in the cell that are like uh, called central males that the microtubules uh, sprout from. So the cell itself has directionality, and you can imagine that the whole entire cell is composed of these uh, long fibrous structures of microtubules and also actin filaments. And uh, and these cargo proteins are in charge of shipping again the, the cargoes from one one part one end of the cell to the other. So why are especially why are motor molecular motors especially important in neurons? Can you think about a reason? Why are molecular motors especially important in neurons? Like the ones that specifically dynein and kinase. Again? One? Yeah. In, in other words, like the, the neurons are the most polar cells that we know, okay? Meaning that the, the distance or the size of the cell, uh, or especially the, the length of the cell, is something that is uh, kind of an anomaly in biology, okay? Like most of the other cells, and I'm saying again most, I, w I, will not, I will never say all, but most of the other cells in the body are pretty much, they have like round structure or a cylinder structure or some kind of other structure that is pretty much uh, confined in their size, so the, I'm not saying that molecular motors are not important for them, they are, but in neurons you can imagine that if uh, this poor cargo proteins needs to now transport, not, uh, not for four, five, six microns, they sometimes have to transport cargo in the distance of meters, okay, for example in the elephant or in our body the longest neuron is in the base of the of the spinal cord in the, in the tip of our toe is one meter long. So this is one cell that is one meter long and this cargo protein now needs to transport uh, elements um, to, to distal locations. Because, and why it's, uh, it's hard to see and why I showed you a, a classical drawing of a neuron is that here the neuron doesn't look very polar. It doesn't look very long, right? It's like, okay, the cell soma somewhere here, there's the dendrites, and then the axon is something like more or less in the order of magnitude of the, of the cell body. But when we start looking at, this is actually, I'm not, I'm not going to show you a motor neuron actually, I'm just going to show you a neuron from the central nervous system uh, in, the, in the cortex, you can see that the picture is pretty different, okay? So what you, it's hard to see here, but the, these, uh, this dotted pink uh, line is actually the axon of the neuron, and everything else is the dendrites. Uh, of the neuron, and you can see that this is a very long and very elaborate network that now the cell has to uh, like maintain constant uh, function or cellular function like any other cell along this like huge distances. So what you said about proteins will return to that because there's a other phenomena that are also very very unique to neurons that we're going to talk about in, in the terms of protein translation, uh, but specifically uh, shipping of these things in neurons is an extremely, uh, extremely demanding task. And I can tell you that only in the past few years, people have started looking at it in neurons and starting to investigate it specifically in neurons. And not surprisingly, they're discovering that a lot of diseases and a lot of symptoms that before that we didn't know what the, what the problem is are arising from the problems and shipment of certain elements along neurons. Because uh, if you will have like a problem in one of these carrying proteins, it might not affect so much like the other cells in the body, but it would affect the neurons much more because they're much more sensitive uh, to that. And actually for us, for molecular biologists, let's say up until also today, the question that we're asking is more like whether a gene or a protein is uh, functional or lost its function uh, in, in like a disease model. So for example, if we have like an Alzheimer's uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, like a brain of an uh, Alzheimer's disease patient that passed away and contributed his brain to science. So what we can do is that we can take the tissue of the brain and we can ask what is the gene expression profile in that tissue? Like, is there a difference from like a normal individual from the same age uh, in the gene expression? And for example, when we talk about protein localization, then we won't see 
like any change. Like it might be that the, that the amount of the protein that is produced is completely normal, but it's not getting inside the cell to the right place at the right time. So for us, it like opens a new, like a new venue or a new level of resolution that only now people are starting to address, also because it's very hard uh, to address it molecularly, and ask whether not the, the problems are not only in the gene expression, for example, in Alzheimer's specifically, because uh, there is like, it's, I think it's the most, no, actually it's the most funded disease in neurodegenerative studies, and people have been studying for the last 50 years, and up until now I can tell you that th there is no progress. Okay, <laughs> like there is absolutely no progress. Like uh, we just like met a year ago with uh, a guy from an NIH, from the NIH that uh, uh, supervises all the clinical studies for Alzheimer's, and they tried like 130 different types of components that showed promises in mice models and uh, primate models, and none of them work in humans, for example. So there's actually up until today, not only that there's no, it doesn't look like we're getting somewhere. But it also the things that people are developing right now, most of the time when you see like someone that developed a very promising Alzheimer drug that, and showed it in mice models, most of the time it won't show in, uh, in humans, okay? And it might be also because of the, the differences, for example, in the size of the neurons between humans and mice. Because mice have much smaller, they're much smaller. So they have much smaller neurons than, uh, than humans, for example, okay? So these are the, I, I'm just uh, giving you an example of the, like the next generation question that we're now asking in molecular biology relative to what, or the tools that we had uh, to ask in the past. So now we get a very long movie. <laughs> just a minute. The what? The movement? So I'll show you in a second. An experiment that, uh, that timed it. So for example, these, the question that you asked is something that we didn't really know up until five, six years ago, okay? Just to show you how, how we're lacking like the basic knowledge of these processes. Our brain is made of billions of nerve cells and they're all connected. If we take a closer look, a nerve cell seems to have antennas. Most of them are receivers of information, but only one is a transmitter, called the axon. This axon is connected to several receivers of other cells, forming a gigantic neural network, the brain. Meet John. John is a kinesin a motor protein. He lives inside a nerve cell and he has a proper job. To ensure that a brain cell does his job properly, it needs the continuous flow of building materials, proteins. They travel through the cell using the cytoskeleton. If you would compare a nerve cell with a city, the cytoskeleton inside the cell would be the roads and the traveling proteins would be the traffic. These materials are towed by motors along the road. The microtubules and the actin filaments we already before are what we call the cytoskeleton of the cell. Okay? So and just as in real life, there are different kinds of motors and different kinds of roads. John's sole purpose in life is to deliver his cargo to a specific place in the axon. He takes the main roads and he walks in just one direction only. John's job may seem easy, but it's not. He has to overcome a number of obstacles to ensure that the right amount of cargo arrives at the right place. To make the journey even more difficult, John is not alone. Other motor proteins ride along with his cargo. They haven't woken up yet, but that will happen soon. The journey starts in the center of the city, just like in the center of the cell. To enter the axon, John has to pass a place called the axon initial segment. In this segment, there are two kinds of roads. The main roads that John uses, called the microtubules, and a lot of little alleys 
called actin. And here, our brave motor protein meets his first challenge, because one of his sleeping travel companions, myosin, has woken up and starts to cling to the actin. So you see, this is myosin. Myosin is what we saw before in muscles. Okay, so you see that the, a lot of time, we, you, when you look at the molecular level in biology, uh, you can see like proteins that, are, that have a specific function that are used differently. Okay, for example, myosin knows how to walk or ha knows how to bind to actin filaments. Okay, so like you said before, these microtubules, they have these actin filaments that are springing from them, and they're like the local roads or the, or the small roads. And because myosin knows how to walk on actin, because this is what it does in, uh, in uh, muscles, so here it's not different from that. And there are a lot of alleys. Only brute force can save John now. Fate strikes again. The other companion, Dainin, wakes up, and he can only walk in the opposite direction of John, resulting in a tug of war. But there can be only one. Along the axon in which John travels, there are places. So, just to, I, I'm, I'm doing the narration, okay, they're explaining what, they're not saying what they're actually talking about, but. The, the thing is that what they're demonstrating here is that there's always competing reactions, okay? The cell is not in vacuum. It, uh, all the reactions that we're talking about and all the processes that we're talking about, there's always a counter, a counter reaction to the reaction. So it's not like in vacuum that the cell like knows. And actually, like the concentration and the amount of kinesine is probably what determines the direction of movement. And if, if you have more dianine, then the dianine will win with the war and probably somewhere along the way where this shipment should, should stop, for example, then you have equal concentration of dynein and kinesine. And then, and then the... Yeah, they can be connected to the same cargo. Along the axon in which John travels, there are places called synapses. Here, the axon connects to receivers of the other cells. Regulating proteins call the shots here this traffic police makes sure that all passing traffic gets to the right destination. If John's cargo is needed in this synapse, he will be stopped and myosins take over his load. But today, John's cargo is safe. You see that the concentration of myosins was very high there, so they might like grab the cargo protein and move it to where it's needed. For example, in a synapse that is very active, then we see an elevation in the in the amount of myosins in that in that synapse, and then you think that because the synapse needs more protein, then it takes more from the from this highway. But what he does not know that his road is under construction, just a few blocks away. In our nerve cells, the cytoskeleton is changing constantly. Roads are built, but are also broken down. Facing this kind of obstruction. John has to find a detour. John isn't the only motor protein on the road. There are many more. Our nerve cells need a smooth traffic flow in order to perform well. A traffic jam due to problems during the journey may ultimately result in brain disease. Understanding the challenges John faces could improve treatment or prevention. Finally, John arrives at his destination. He has fulfilled his destiny. But several other Johns are just getting started. Okay, so I hope this uh, illustrates it a little bit better and also why it's important to neurons, but Obviously, it's important for all the cells, okay? Not, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not the one that's gonna say that only neurons are important and the other cells are not. They're all important, but some are more important than others. <laughs> no, they're more interesting than others. I'm not saying more important. So, uh, regarding to your question about the, the time uh, or the, 
how fast these uh, move. So in order to do that, we need to get to a resolution where you can start imaging, like for example, a specific molecule and measuring it across the length uh, of a fiber or an axon. So for example, in this, in this paper from 2016, which is very recent, this is exactly what they did, is that they, ma uh, they managed to uh, specifically tag, it's not, it's not that they did it first, but they did it, uh, the nicest that I found is that uh, what they do here is that in, the, in this video, the red dots are single kinesin uh, molecules and the green are the microtubules. And this whole video will take 15 seconds, but it's actually like uh, it's two minutes long. Okay, so what you see here is exactly like these uh, j small johns, you can imagine, that are moving uh, along. And also you can see that some of them are like not mobile, some of them are mobile, some of them are like diverting and standing in, in place. And this is exactly, but they're all moving in the same direction, okay? Because this is a kinesin, it can only move in the, in the positive pole uh, direction of the microtubules. Yeah, in the same microtubules, they can go in, the, in different directions, but normally if you have like high concentrations of, uh, uh, of, uh, of kinesin, then then it will move only in the direction of the kinesin. And if you have more uh, uh, dynein, then they move in the other direction. Okay. This is a little bit, yeah. This is fast forward like uh, eight fold. No, yeah. Eight fold because it's 15 seconds and it's two minutes. So, but, but in general, and this scale bar is one micron. Okay. So one micron, like a thousand micron is one millimeter. Okay, so you can imagine what I told you before about the... So we, we can say that uh, one of these kinesin molecules uh, can move like a few microns per minute. And if you multiply it and you start thinking about, and this is a teaser for the next, uh, for one of the next chapters, uh, whether it's actually like, uh, and you can already start thinking about it, about how long would it take, for example, for a protein to get from the uh, from the cell body where it is classically produced and to get to like a one meter long uh, axon. So it's like, it's a, we said it, that a few microns takes, a few micron or one micron can take one minute. So we have in a meter, we have a million microns. So it will take like a million minutes for a protein to reach, through a cargo protein to reach from the cell body uh, that is like this one meter axon to get to the final end of, the, of that axon. And that's a pretty long time. Okay? But there is a solution to that. Okay? But in next chapters. So, the last part of this uh, chapter, which was also is ver so very critical for you to read before, uh, to, to understand before reading the article that you need to, to read for next class, is what are the methods uh, that we can uh, start studying proteins uh, for us, okay? Or what are the classical methods? I'm only talking now about the classical methods because we don't have time to talk about the really sophisticated methods uh, for purifying, detecting, and characterizing proteins. So why do we need to purify a protein? I think it's pretty obvious because if we have like a cell or a tissue and we want to ask a question, if in Alzheimer's disease, um, I don't know, uh, some kind of protein, protein X, is overexpressed, or there is more of that protein relative to a control subject. So we have to isolate that protein from all the mixture of all the other things that you have there. So all the other things are like membranes, um, uh, other, other proteins, DNA, RNA, all these other, other things. So the first step is purification. And <coughs> we'll describe two types uh, of purification. One of them is purifi purifying the protein according to its size or the molecular weight. And th the second one is, uh, is affinity purification by specific properties of that specific neurons that we, uh, that specific protein that we know uh, in advance. So th the most common way to separate or to purify, uh, to purify a protein in the lab is through a process that's called electrophoresis, which we separate according to size. So the thing is that the concept starts by denaturing the proteins that we have. Why? Because you saw that each protein has its own special 3D conformation. We talked about the tertiary structure and, 
uh, of the protein. So because each protein has its own uh, spatial conformation, it's very hard to separate according to, to its size or to assess its real size because each, each protein can fold in different ways and different sizes and not necessarily according to the right length of the protein. So the first step of what we do is the, we add this molecule, which is SDS. It's called SDS molecule. And this molecule is very long. And what it does, it denatures, it immediately denatures the protein. And another property of this SDS molecule is that it's negatively charged. Okay? Negative? Yes. Positive? Positive? Uh, yeah, it's negatively charged. Sorry. I remembered correctly. I don't know why. Okay. So the SDS molecule is negatively charged, and it's very long. So do you remember that now we need, uh, again, to, to bring you back to your chemical intuition that by now you're real expert in? What are the bonds that will help me if I want to design like a molecule that will bind to any protein? Okay, now I want something that will bind to any protein and uh, in a non-specific way, in a very homogeneous way along the protein and straighten it out. What kind of bond should I go for? Should I go for hydrogen bond is one option, okay? But again, hydrogen bonds are not like it depends on the also because you're you're imagining the protein to be something that is uh, a lot of times that uh, the backbone of the protein is not accessible, okay? Because you have like uh, amino acids with large size groups and stuff like that. But there's another type of interaction that we talked about that's very non-specific. Like hydrogen is needs hydrogen. Right, so van der Waals interaction in this case, because this, part, because this molecule is very flexible and very long, it's like a fatty acid or something like that, like in, in structure, then it actually associates to the protein through van der Waals interaction and straightens it out. And because it's so negatively charged, it doesn't matter what is the charge, like the, the charged uh, amino acids that were in the protein before, it just masks all the charge and gives it a very homogeneous negative charge along the entire protein. So what it does is actually eliminate the effect of different shapes and different charges of the protein and gives us a constant charge to mass ratio. Meaning that if you have a longer protein, if the protein, if the primary structure of the protein is longer, then it will have more negative uh, charges, but the ratio of length actually, on, or mass or length to charge is constant now. And why is that important? Because the next step is that we're going to take these, uh, these molecules after we added the SDS, and we're going to run them through a gel. So molecularly, and we're going to, first of all, we're going to apply force, like electro, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, like in, in the source of a, in the, in the form of a, a constant electric field. So this electric field will now pull the negatively charged uh, molecules, negatively charged protein, coated proteins with the SDS through this gel. And when you look into in, inside gels in the molecular level, you actually see that they, they're like meshes. They're like, you can think about like fisherman nets, okay? And if we are passing our proteins through, through, through this kind of net formation, then if a protein is smaller, it will pass faster through that net. And if a protein is larger, it will pass slower. So the holes in the net are large enough for even large proteins to pass through, but it just takes them more time, okay? And because we completely eliminated the third structure, the secondary structure of the protein, then the shape of the protein doesn't matter anymore because all of the proteins are denatured to their linear form, and now we can actually separate them according to their size. So for example, if we know, if we have prior knowledge on the size of the protein that we want to isolate, then we can isolate it according to this uh, according to this method. And again, you have a movie, because I don't want you to imagine too much that describes this. SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is a powerful tool which resolves proteins according to their molecular weights. Because proteins differ in size, shape, and charge, a protein sample is first denatured with the anionic detergent SDS. You also sometimes apply heat, but it's normally not needed. When the sample is heated, 
the SDS molecules bind to the proteins and cause them to unfold. The denatured proteins become uniformly coated with negatively charged SDS molecules, so they all have a similar shape and charge to mass ratio. If a protein is composed of several subunits, the SDS not only unfolds the protein, but also dissociates the protein into its individual polypeptide chains. The mixture of denatured proteins is then transferred from the tube and loaded into a well that has been cast in the top of a polyacrylamide gel. In an electric field generated by a power supply, the negatively charged polypeptides migrate through the gel toward the positive electrode at the bottom of the gel. The migrating polypeptides are retarded by the tangled network of polyacrylamide. Smaller polypeptides travel more easily and quickly through the pores in the network than do larger polypeptides. Because the polypeptides have similar charge to mass ratios, the distance they travel through a gel is dependent only on molecular weight. Based on this principle, proteins are separated according to their sizes, with low molecular weight proteins having greater mobility than... Okay, so I hope that it gives you intuition about that. So the, the second way to purify proteins is by affinity, and we'll go over this actually very, very fast, and because also uh, it's not very commonly used, only in labs that specifically study specific types of proteins, but uh, this is like what we call gel filtration uh, chromatography, in which you have these uh, beads that have specific type of properties um, that we want our, our protein to bind to or not bind to accordingly. For example, in this case, this is gel filtration by size, okay? So you have this polymer gel bead that has these small uh, holes in it, and pr small proteins will fit inside these small holes, and large proteins will just wash through. So we load our, uh, our samples over here, and we apply it, and we wash it with a buffer, and during this washing, so it happens like it's like the opposite of what we saw before in the polyacrylamide gel. Now, the small molecules will bind or uh, will slow down with these polymer gel beads and the large molecules uh, will pass first. So if you, like, you can do several types of washing or several steps of washing, and according to that, get different sizes uh, of proteins according to the number of washing uh, that you'll do. First you get the large molecules, then the smaller, and then the smaller ones in the, uh, in the rest of it. Another type of chromatography is doing it according to other properties. For example, here is charge. If we want to separate the positively charged proteins from negatively charged proteins, then our beads is uh, positively, the, the gel beads are now positively charged. So in this case, the positively charged neutral will pass through and the negatively charged will remain. And in order to release the negatively charged, we will add a salt. That the salt will compete with the negatively charged proteins and also the, <coughs> the sodium will will attract them so the chloride, uh, the chloride ions will compete with the binding site of the negatively charged proteins and they will be uh, washed through. So I'm going in very fast, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last type of, uh, of chromatography is affinity chromatography in which now, now our silicon beads, we will attach an antibody. We didn't talk about so much about antibodies yet, but uh, antibodies are like natural elements of our body that know how to recognize specific parts of proteins. Okay, this is how our immune system uses to detect like intruders. Or for example, when you get a vaccination, then your body develops antibodies against proteins of that vaccine or that entity uh, that were introduced into your body. So we can use it in our lab uh, the same way. For example, the most, the most common way to do that is to take uh, normally an animal model. They, uh, most of the time they use either like big, r relatively big animals like rabbits or goats or donkeys. And what they do in, in these pharmaceutical companies is that they inject the specific agent that you want the, the animal to develop an antibody against, and then you can purify uh, from, you don't have to sacrifice the animal or anything uh, like that, you can purify from the blood of the animal uh, the specific antibodies that were produced against the protein that you put there. 
And, and then you can sell this antibody for people that want to detect their protein and isolate their protein. They attach it to these beads. And now when we will wash our sample through this uh, column, then only our uh, target antibody, uh, the, the target protein, will be recognized by the antibody and will remain here. Then we can wash it with a low pH. And uh, I don't know if I told you, but one of the ways to, for example, to ruin the affinity of, uh, of antibodies and proteins in general to disrupt, because antibodies are also proteins. So if we want to disrupt the structure and then the antibody will lose their binding ability, we can lower the pH. This is one of the reasons that our body always has to keep a constant pH. And different pHs, the, the, all the side groups of the amino acid will behave completely differently. And then you have a completely different secondary structure and third structure. So if you elute it with a lower pH, then you will start denaturing the antibodies, they will lose their binding ability, and you will, you will be able to extract the protein of interest. So, <coughs> uh, no, 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 no. Okay, skip that, and we'll talk about the technique which is also very important for the article that you're gonna read, uh, which is Western bloating. And Western bloating is a combination of, of what I told you before with the antibody affinity detection that we, and uh, that we talked uh, like uh, a few seconds ago. So the, the Western blotting actually has uh, four steps. The, for, the first step is gel electrophoresis like you saw in the movie and I, and I talked to you before. First you separate your sample according to the size. Then you transfer it to uh, like a paper uh, membrane in order for the, the proteins to stick to that membrane. But you do like what we call a horizontal transfer. So you maintain the differences in size. Then you add an antibody, normally a primary antibody that is not marked with, uh, with anything that you can detect, but this antibody uh, can detect the target protein that you're interested in seeing. And then you add a secondary antibody that this antibody can target the, f the primary antibody. And this secondary antibody will normally be linked with some kind of uh, detector molecule, like a fluorescent molecule or some kind of molecule that when we add an when we add a certain material, it will change color, for example, or will uh, fluoresce in a bright light. And what, what we actually get here is that in the end, we'll see like a band, or we see like a, uh, a strong band in the gel, and we can know